morning. Anybody else? I was talking to one of my coaches and how the uh, engagement of you guys on here really impacts us. I was watch, uh, listening also to um, John Maxwell in that we feed when we have these conversations off of Zoom and webinars because we're not in a physical setting. And so thank you for all those that leave comments. I do appreciate it. And uh, thank you for being on here this morning. So let's get ourselves started here. Um, my name is Brock Zeven. I am, <clears throat> excuse me, a life coach, business coach. I'm a real estate agent and a dad. So we got to do the dad thing this morning. Brielle had her first day of fifth grade. And then uh, Bryce had, he moved up as well because both of them just uh, had their birthday. So Bryce moved up to a new classroom. So he had his first day in a new classroom. Um, Brielle wanted nothing to do with me. I actually rolled down my window to say hi to a couple teachers. And she told me to roll up my window, turn down the music. Dad had to stop talking to people. And Bryce not so good. He cried. It wasn't a very good morning. The worst thing is when you have to leave your child and he is crying. So I had that morning today. So kind of rejuvenate and get myself started. So um, part of me wanted to talk about personalities of all the unique drivers out there today, because I saw a lot of interesting moves, interesting traffic. It was just, but I'm not going from it. I'm going to talk about my new book. So I read 10 pages every single day. I actually just, just finished putting my together my morning routine. I know some of you asked me for it, but I want to make sure it looked professional. I want to make sure there was something that you can use. And so I just, just finished it. Um, so we're going to be pushing that out here very shortly. And part of my morning routine is I read 10 pages every day. I'm going on book number, I think it was either 69 or 70. Um, and so I've been doing it for almost 18 months and that's where it got me. So I just finished a topic habits. And so I was trying to decide between the book, your next five moves and Christian was the one that got this to me or my other book was failing forward with John Maxwell. Well, I ended up going failing forward because part of, I, I like to look at what's going on in my life. And so I'm coming into a lot of roadblocks, a lot of challenges. And so I thought failing forward would be a better book for me. And so when I do some of my morning conversations, I like to find books that or what I'm reading to be able to share with you. And so one of the cool things that I've learned when I study the book, um, I actually YouTube it. I find out how the author created the book. And ironically, why I talked about how we feed off of our engagements or speaking opportunities that we have with people like you guys and different events that I speak at is that's when books come into play. That's when our conversations or topic come into play because our audience helps us. And so the book Failing Forward is actually was when John Maxwell, he the, the, the title of his theme at the time period was Failure is Not Final. Well, then as he was speaking, ironically, like sometimes Wendy's like, well, what are you going to talk about? I'm like, I don't know. Sometimes I, I just say a prayer before and it just, it just comes out of my mouth and I don't even know sometimes. And so that's what happened to him was it was failure is not final. And then he ended up saying failing forward. And the whole audience was like, wow. And he's like, huh, I'm on to something here. So that's how the book was started. Failing forward was ironically, spontaneously in one of his speaking engagements. That's how it came into play. So I thought that was really cool. And that was, I was reading it. He talks about how success and failure are enemies. And then in reality, when he dove deeper into it, I say it to people many, many times, and he actually did a study that majority of all successful people failed. And he was like, huh, seems like there's something onto it. So he created a formula, a cycle to say, on how to be successful. And so that was my title today was how to become successful was me sharing with you the cycle of success. And for those that are able to write down piece on a piece of paper, this was the things that I wrote down this morning. The first thing that happens in failure in the success cycle is you first test something. You test out what you're going to try. You create it inside your brain. You can create it inside your mind. And then you go out and you test it. Then you find out whether it was successful or not. And sometimes people say that if you tried it and you did it and you nailed it on the first time, then that probably your goal, your challenge wasn't as 
as as uh, how would I say as challenging as you need it to be. Okay. So Karen, when I went back and I was like, huh, that was something that was really good there. So I was like, the first one was, I got to test something. If I quickly do it, maybe it wasn't challenging enough. So Chris, then I go to the second one and it says number two is fail. Because if you achieve success, then you got to go to fail. Okay. So the number two is you fail at it. Well, once you get past that failure, I don't know if, if, if you're like this. But when I fail at something or something doesn't go my way, I go to the second step. And Amy, the set, the third step, I'm sorry, the Amy, the third step is what did I learn? What did I learn from this situation on what we got going on? So then I say, okay, I test something. I see if I failed at it. And then I learn from it. Okay. And then once I learned from whatever the situation took place, I said, okay, well, that makes sense. I see, I see where I could have done better. And then what I do is I go back, Claudia, and I say, how can I improve this situation? How can I improve what just happened to me? What can I take from what I've learned? All right, that makes sense. Now, how can I or how can I improve that situation? What steps can I do to be better at that? And then here's the hardest part. The fifth step. Right, and uh, when I look at this, Taylor, and I, it reminded me of some of our conversations. What you have to do is you actually have to start back from the beginning again, and you got to go back in and re-enter that cycle, re-enter that same challenge, that same vision, that same thing. Kind of like a for sale by owner, kind of those expired, some of those calls that we don't want to make, some of those conversations that we don't want to have. And you go back into it and you be like, okay, well, this time, what I've learned from my failure is if I improve from this specific performance, then that way I have a better chance of being successful because my experience have taught me this and how to improve. This is one big thing that I've seen that I've learned for those that are my football gurus out there on why they stay st statistically majority of all Super Bowl champions are won by the team who has the most experienced players, veterans on their team. Now, why is that? Well, that's because they have learned, they have failed, they have improved, and then they got themselves back into it so they know some of their expectations based off their experiences. Just like we say many times that I have many conversations with older people because they can share their experiences on what they've improved on to be able to help my learning process because I will fail because John Maxwell says that if you want to be successful, you have to fail and you have to fail often and you should fail fast. Because the faster you fail at something, the more times you fail, the more times you're learning, the more times you improve, and you got to get back into that cycle. The challenge becomes that many of us have outside distractions that when we do fail, we stop at step two. We don't get to a step three, and we go to what we call the abbreviated section over here at the very, on the side, it says quit. We stay in a complacency. We stay in our comfort zone. So that takes shape. And so the success cycle to me was something that was important. It doesn't get you all warm and fuzzy. I'm not like all yelling in, in, in anybody's faces because to me, formulas, I always loved math. You give me science, vocabulary, those other subjects I struggled in. Okay. But math, I did really good at because once you put the formula in, there's only one answer. So in this case here, the success cycle states that you test something, you fail at something, then you go into learning something, you improve it, and then you re-back enter into it. It's just a cycle that you have. So don't stop at number two, which is failure. And I challenge for those that are on here, 
the Josies, the Claudias, the Facebook world to challenge your cycle to see what step you're willing that you're willing to go to and look at your goals and look at your 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 vision and see where you are on that on the success cycle and be like, oh boy, I failed quite a bit. What do I need to learn? Who can I talk to? Who has more experience to be able to help me improve so I can jump back in? So I really am enjoying my book, Failing Forward, <clears throat> and hopefully this next couple, uh, these next two weeks, basically, just like anything, I statistically can tell you by how many pages there are in here, 205, I know exactly how many days, and roughly it's going to take me less than three weeks to finish this book, okay? It's just a science, It's just a math problem, guys, 10 pages a day by how many pages, and then that's how I calculate, and that's how I keep myself in, in, on pace, okay? Formulas. Success cycle is a formula just as well. Apply it and the stuff that you have going on today and your aim for success. So that being said, I'm going to dive into mornings with Mike. Mike, we got about five minutes here um, before we switch over into the team meeting. And so mornings with Mike has been started. Mike and I have been working together for several years. And Mike's a successful agent. And he does property management. He runs a car dealership. He has many streams of income that he works with. And him and I have many stories from our past where we're cut from the same cloth and how we did things. And I really appreciate Mike and sharing his experiences. And so this past weekend, we had a person, we had a, each an experience in reference to getting a house under contract that were very similar in prices. And him and I just started going and going and going and be like, well, what was the difference here? What did you do here? And how did this come into play for you? And so we had all these conversations of like, what's the difference? And one of the things that we came across was personalities and motivation. So Mike, I'm going to bring you on here and um, kind of ask you a little bit what, you know, you and I were talking about how an investor mindset is a little bit different. And you might, you guys all might be like, well, yeah, Brock, an investor mindset is different than, you know, a personal mindset for what you got going on. But to me, I think it's how you control something and where you come from. So Mike, I'm going to bring you on and, and uh, good morning, sir. Well, good morning. Good morning out there, everybody. So yeah, we were having a conversation about uh, how you approach different situations because I just said, hey, it's Monday and uh, what a uh, comparative difference between uh, the transaction you went through, Brock, and then the one I went through, which were almost identical with different results. And uh, so the short version was his uh, house property was at like 327.5, got an offer for 312, um, went under contract at 325. We have a house that's at 325, got an offer for 311, countered at 3125, and they walked away. <laughs> and I said, really, it's it's understanding who you've got and uh, what is the um, motivation of each one of the uh, of your clients. Um, you need to understand who they are, what they are. Again, a lender or a lender, uh, an investor is only concerned with the numbers. There's no emotion. And Brock was kind of telling me how he negotiated through and, and you kind of play on the emotions. And really it comes down to, like I said, when you're, when you have an agent um, and you're hiring, one of the things you're really looking for and, and conveying this to your client is our ability to negotiate in these situations. Because as I told my client, I'm like, look, the guy wants 311. You said you'd go down to three lower than that. Actually, why try to go back? He goes, Oh, just make a counter offer and, you know, see what he says. And so now I make, get to make the phone calls is, yeah, they walked away. And I think he's going to be like, what happened? You've got to take a look at who you're dealing with and what you're dealing with. And investors don't think of, like uh, a typical buyer does. Um, again, somebody on our team, Braden, um, he put in an offer on a house. It was about 15000 roughly under asking. And the agent called him back and said, hey, we got multiple offers. We're calling for highest and best. And he's like, what should I do? And I kind of laughed. I said, multiple offers means they got one other low ball offer other than yours. And they're trying to get you up or them up one or the other. And uh, mm. I said, because if you offered 15,000 under four months ago and they got multiple offers, they're not wasting their time to call you to see if you're willing to change your offer. They're laughing at you and like, yeah, you didn't get it even close. So you have to know the situation you're dealing with, the, uh, the mood of the market, so to speak, manage your uh, 
clients, whether it's a seller or buyer's expectations, and really understand what you're dealing with. And uh, again, I've got a set of buyers, um, they're first time home buyers. I was telling this to Brock, and they're in that mindset, which I'm like flashback of pre COVID, that we'll go out and look at a house, and she fell in love with it. And he was like, Well, I like it too. I think we can get 15,000 under. And I said, well, we can offer whatever you want, but here's the numbers. Here's where it works. This house is going to sell at this price. It was priced right. Well, we just really want to get a deal. And I was like, wow, this is just like a flashback out of the script. And again, it's like, okay. And I had the conversations with them, but now it's going to be like, okay, we have to lose one or two or three or five houses. Then you'll come back around to, okay, listening to me. So today's lesson that I said I would take away from this and learn is understanding who your client is, managing their expectations, but at the same time you work for them, you got to do what they say. And then you got to find a way to say, I told you so. I told you it was 311. Why ask for 1500 back? Take the deal. Because here's why they put 3000 in due diligence. I'm like, good Lord. You just lost 3000 in due diligence, even if the deal wouldn't have closed because you wanted 1500 more or your first time home buyer. And now you want to try and get 15, 20, 25,000 under asking just because you want a really good deal. Okay. We'll go back to that script where, okay, after you lose four or five or six, maybe you'll listen to me. So it's, um, that's my takeaway for this week. Yeah. <clears throat> Couldn't have said it better when you're managing expectations of people. Good morning, Pat. And when we're doing this, guys, and Mike and I was like, he was asking me like, well, what did you say? How did this come into play? Because we were at 327 and they came in at 312. And how did you get them to 325? At the same anecdote, I have a seller who's like scared out of their mind because we already just lost a deal. And so he's like, Brock, you better not lose it. And I was just like, well, I, I mean, obviously I, I don't want to lose it either, but at the same token, I got to let this, this buyer know that you can't come down. Like, well, I guess you can come down, but in my mind, I'm like, what are you doing? 312? Come on now. And so my mindset was this. And so here's the question that I asked him. I said, and for those that, that really are negotiating and you want to become a strong negotiator, the question in the moment, because when I ask this question at the listing table, time has developed, situations have happened, and their answer is going to be different from when I do it at the listing presentation to when I'm in negotiations. And I said, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, what price point are you willing to go to today? Okay. I'm going to say it again because that sets the stage and what I can negotiate and what I can do. Because if my conversation does go south, when my client says to me, Brock, I'm a little nervous, I don't want you to lose this deal. So now I come from a scarcity seller. See, I come from an abundant mindset because I'm like, well, I'll make it work. I'll figure out a way. Can there be scarce? Can there, there be a way to lose? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So my abundant mindset says, okay, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, I understand that. And I don't want to scare them away either because you don't make any money and I don't make any money. So let me ask you this question. At what price point are you willing to go to today? What's your bottom line number today? Do you think everybody, give me a thumbs up or tell me if you agree. Do you think it changed from when I went to my listing presentation two months ago to today? How many of you would agree that number changed? Yeah. Okay. Think about that. Time has a way of making change. So wouldn't you guys agree that when that situation, that question comes into play, it's a lot different now when I have that conversation. Okay, I got it. So I can get to that. So when I call my buyer agent and I have a conversation with, notice that I said the word call. Okay. I'm going to end this here shortly. Notice I said the word call, Josie. Okay. I didn't say text them back. I didn't say email I said I called her back because I don't want to lose out on the deal, but I need to earn more money for my client. Not only did I come from an abundant mindset of telling her, hey, I just want to let you know we do have another showing. Okay. I also want to let them know, Claudia, that I have four open houses coming up this weekend. <gasps> oh, boy. I didn't know about that. Of course you didn't because I didn't put an MLS yet, but that's typically what we do. We got four open houses coming in. Okay. Adding that scarcity to the buyer. And I said to her, listen, I got to be at 325. 
My client just lost a deal at 330. I'm at 327. I also know it when I dropped this price to possibly 325, I just took a look at the target market analysis and I got 27 buyers waiting between 300 and 324. Oh my goodness, Brock, I did not know that. Okay, let me go call my client. Now, if she got all squirmy on me, and I feel that she might be going, oh my gosh, Brock, I don't think my client's going to go that way. So Karen, when I have that conversation and I feel it in that tonality, that's why I say, call, I said, listen, I said, I don't, I, I can possibly work with you. I just, 325 is what they're saying, but I do know I have just, I have a little bit more room, but you're going to have to come back with something better. If she came and told me that, because remember, I can't scare this person. I use the knowledge that I have because I asked the right question to say what price point you're willing to go below because they told me what price they can go at and 325 wasn't it. So I knew I had that in my back pocket so I can have my conversation so I don't scare them. Then they feel like, wow, Brock's really working with me. He's giving me some inside information. Okay. I didn't give it. I just said that there's a possibility in case they were going to run because I don't want to scare them. Not only guys. They increased due diligence $2,000. I went from a $325, $3,000 due diligence close. They wanted to close in 40 some days. I need to close this thing next month. They called the lender up. They got approval or they got it to set in 30 days and they increased due diligence to $5,000. So here I go to $325, $5,000 on how I presented my offer, knowing that my clients were scared, using the scarcity mindset to go into it, to talk to the buyer's agent. Nothing was illegal. I just used the, the, the tools that were shared to me that I've learned over time. That's what I got. Hopefully you picked up something in the negotiating side of things. Anybody got any questions for me? Anybody got any, anything on that? Big Mike, anything that, that you can add to it here the last 30 seconds or somebody want to throw something out at us? No, I think you covered it from my end. I agree with everything you said. So no, with you. Cool, man. Anybody else got anything they want to add or say? You good? People like it? Don't like it? Hell, Brock, we're just trying to find a house to sell. I don't know. Guys, there's opportunities out there. I was working on a commercial deal. I said, why would you say that? Well, I don't know. That's what I thought. I said, do you even know that that's the number? Well, no. Well, then ask him what number will make you feel comfortable with my offer. Put the ball back in people's courts, guys. When you negotiate, stop giving out like assumptions. Okay? Use questions to help get answers. And don't do it texting an email. It drives me insane when people do that. I'm pretty sure if you were going to get engaged, you wouldn't send a text message to the significant other that you want to get engaged to. Okay. They're going to go tell you to fly a kite. Keep that mindset. It's the biggest thing in your life. You're going to get engaged. They're selling the biggest thing. They're buying the biggest thing. Pick up the phone, guys. Makes a world of difference. And guess what? As soon as I got it, I said, hey, do you mind filling out a Google review and how I negotiated with you? Brock, we would love to. We had no idea we could do this. It's a perfect time to get Google reviews. I had three Google reviews when I started this year. I just got, I think, 52 now asking people, hey, could you do this for me? I need a favor. All right, I'm done. Anybody got anything? I'm ready to move on. Great stuff. Guys, if you liked it, send me a heart, send me a like. Appreciate all the engagement getting back to you. It is the end of the month. It is a new week, a new opportunity to be able to find some business and to be able to find something. You got to pick up the phone. You got to have conversations with people. That's what it's all about. Knowing the right questions to ask. Pat, you have a phenomenal day. In the real estate, in the uh, Zoom world, we are staying here in Facebook world. If you want to listen in more and more about what I do during my day, you want to listen more to what some of these other agents do and have more conversations with us and engage, come to Zoom, come to that side of things. So that way you could talk to us and we can also see your smiling faces. I always like to get the videos going. So um, great stuff. If you have questions for me, you can always text me or send me a personal direct message on Facebook world. Facebook world, we will see you tomorrow at 815. Excited to have you.